Okay, hello YouTube. Um, today we're going to be continuing to explore the land of E4, E5. We're going to be learning how to play E5 against E4. And the main move that we're going to be focusing on today is the move Knight C3, which is called the Vienna Variation. We're going to be learning how to play against the Vienna. So before I go any further, um, if you like my content and you want to see more content like this, please go ahead and hit that like button and please subscribe. So the Vienna, as I was always taught it, is an attempt to play the King's Gambit, but to play it under more favorable circumstances. So for example, if Black were to play a move like Knight C6, which doesn't fit with most King's Gambit defenses, uh, White would continue with a move like Pawn to F4 to try to play like a favorable kind of King's Gambit. Now, of course, that's not the only reason people play the Vienna. There are other setups. Uh, most notably, white can employ setups with g3, and white can employ setups with bishop c4. So you have to be prepared to meet all of those setups. So the first thing that I recommend is I recommend the move knight f6, putting direct pressure on the e4 square. But more importantly, we're preparing to meet the move f4 if he does his decided choice, which is to go into a type of king's gambit, but a move delayed. We're preparing to meet the move f4 with the move d5. Now what's really interesting about this move is what this move really does at its core is it's kind of playing a, another opening. It's playing the Falk Beer counter gambit against the king's gambit, but it's doing it with the moves knight f6 and knight c3 inserted. And that's really important because if we take a look at the king's gambit, which happens after e4, e5, f4, the Falk Beer counter gambit is the move d5. And I actually do not recommend the Falkbeer counter gambit for black. I think it is a bad opening to play with the black pieces. I gotta be completely honest. But the reason I think it's a bad opening is after the main line was say e takes d5, and by the way, I do think e takes f4 is a reasonable way to play it. That's more of a modern variation. But e takes f4 is reasonable. So if you do like the Falkbeer, you don't have to follow through with the previous main idea of the Falkbeer, which is to play e4. And then the idea is to prevent this knight from coming to the f3 square. I think this is bad against the straight king's gambit move order because white can play the move pawn to d3 and contest the center of the board immediately. So the primary goal of playing the Falkbeer is to control the f3 square and prevent the knight from going there. But you're unable to do that in the king's gambit because white jumps on top of this pawn so quickly. So for example, if you tried to insert the move knight f6, white wouldn't reply with the move knight to c3. White would instead capture that annoying pawn immediately. And then after knight takes e4, simply develop his knight to f3 as he normally would and slight advantage white all day long. No problems, right? He's actually up a pawn here. So that's a non-issue for white. So you would have to do something else. And the something else that you're kind of forced to do is you're kind of forced to play queen takes d5 because there really is nothing else. White is threatening to play d captures e4. Unfortunately, this leaves you with an exposed queen that white can now take advantage of. White can play knight c3. You have to play bishop b4 to pin that because you have to try to prove that you've done something with your moves. So you have to keep your queen in the middle. After bishop d2, you have to take that knight, bishop takes, and then of course the bishop is threatening g7, we have to develop our knight to f6, and then we simply put more pressure on this e4 pawn with queen to e2, and then the only way we're going to pretend like all of this works is if we attack that queen, so we have to play bishop to g4. So all of these moves are relatively forced because of what black was forced to do in the opening. And now, unfortunately, white can just ignore that bishop attack and can play d takes e4, and all of white's opening problems are solved. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the position after, say, queen takes e4, knight f3, bishop f3, gf3, queen e2, bishop e2, you might think, well, black's position actually looks okay. The reality is, is it's not. Actually, black's position is probably close to lost already. Uh, white has the bishop pair, but more importantly, white is going to jump on top of some of these open files really quickly, especially the G file and the D file. And because of this, it actually makes it nearly impossible for black to ever get his position off the ground. If you run this position on an engine, the computer actually gives this position close to plus two for white, which is just an absolutely amazing assessment, considering on the surface, black has an unbroken pawn structure, and white, of course, had, has doubled isolated pawns. But the open lines for the bishops and the open files for the rooks just matter more than that. So a sample variation would be like, let's say, black plays knight h5. We would simply castle, castles, rook g1, putting our rook in the open file. And then as you can see, this knight on b8 has a difficult time developing. And if it wants to develop, 
it would have to develop to a square like c6, which would allow a hammer blow like knight rook d rook d5 hitting the knight. And we can't play g6 because simply rook takes h5 because that g7 pawn is pinned. So we'd have to play a move like f5, further opening diagonals. We'd play bishop c4, king h8, rook d7, and basically the position is just completely lost for black. It would just be over. But actually the position is likely completely lost just at the beginning of that position. The open files and the open diagonals are just going to be too much, really no matter what black chooses as his moves from that point going forward. So that's the main reason I don't recommend the Falk beer. But after the move f4, d5, we're basically playing a Falk beer, but we're playing it under slightly different conditions. And those slightly different conditions are really important. So basically, white is going to continue into the Falk beer after e takes d4. We're going to play the Falk beer counter gambit idea. We're going to play e4. And why is this so different? Well, this is so different because we have not committed to the move queen takes d5. Actually, here, of course, the move queen takes d5 would be a horrible idea because the knight is on c3, so we're not playing queen takes d5. But it actually makes it really difficult for white to do the same thing that he just did to black, which is basically, you know, uh, go after this pawn on e4 in the same way and break up that position as quickly. So, for example, in the game uh, Ponomaria versus Ding Liren, uh, Ponomaryev put pressure on that pawn. He played queen e2, bishop f5, and he did play d3. And then Ding Liren just played bishop b4, bishop d2, and then castles. So notice all of the obligations that didn't happen here. We didn't have to play queen d5, and because we didn't have to play queen d5, we didn't have to play bishop takes c3 right away either. So there was a bunch of stuff that happened that we didn't have to do. And actually, uh, what Ding did is he waited until d takes e4. Now he plays bishop takes c3. And of course, now you can see the idea is after bishop c3, we're going to play knight takes e4, and we're threatening that bishop on c3, our king is castled, and we still, of course, have not played queen takes d5, and that allowed after castle's queen side him to play knight takes c3, b takes c3, and black actually ended up going on to win this game. Um, this is a much more favorable type of uh, fault beer counter game, but we've messed up the position of the white king, and Ding Liren actually went on to win in Panamaria versus um, Ding Liren, and that game was played back in uh, 2016. So we go back to this. D takes e5, e takes d5, e4 is our Falk beer counter gambit idea. So that's one way to play this position. But what if they don't play e takes d5? Because we've played d5, there's a lot of stuff going on in the center. They could, of course, play f takes e5. What's interesting is almost no matter what you choose here as black, just as long as you don't lose material, any capture seems to lead to some sort of slight edge for black or at least complete equality. So you can take solace in the fact that after you play d5, it's actually very difficult to screw up at least the next couple of moves. So it's actually very difficult to make a mistake in the next few moves. So the move that I recommend here is, of course, the move uh, knight takes e4. And then there's basically two moves that can get played here. There's um, the move that I think you're going to see a lot on the amateur level is they're just going to capture and then you can play D captures. Now the difficulty here is black actually has a slight edge here. It is far more important that black has a pawn on the E4 square, preventing white from moving his knight to F3, than it is that black has a that white has a pawn on the E5 square, preventing black from moving nothing. Since black does not have an F a, a, a G8 knight, the pawn on E5 is not a hindrance to black but the pawn on e4 is a hindrance to white. So even though at first it looks like we've kind of exchanged um, these pawn behind the lines, you know, black has a pawn behind the lines and so does white, this favors black quite a bit more because it hinders white's development, but doesn't hinder black's. So actually most players in this position are playing the move pawn to d4. Now, if they try to do something else, it's just really awkward for them to finish their development. I, I created like this weird, crazy line just in case somebody tried something crazy. They could play a move like queen e2, bishop f5, and then just go nuts and try to take all your pawns. But this looks really horrible for white, actually. I created kind of this fantasy variation, just me playing around with the computer just to see what would happen if white just went after all the pawns. And of course, white just kind of ends up getting mated in the middle of the board. Already black is getting ready to play rook fc8 and then continue with knight takes e5 with this knight coming to d3. So I, I make believe played uh, queen e6, you know, bishop a6, queen e6. The bishop would have to retreat and then we would do the idea anyway. And as you can see, we'd get something like this. And of course, this position is, I mean, we don't have to go much further. This position is basically 
over. We would play bishop g4, we would play rook e8, and we'd just go after him, and uh, this would be death. You know, white would basically lose in the middle of the board. So if if they really do anything other than pawn to d4 to get rid of this problem, it, it seems like black's position is really easy to play. Now, after d4, e takes d4, bishop d3, knight c6, and these moves, white ends up with an isolated pawn on e5, and also black's development is actually really um, easy. So an example would be bishop c5, c3, we simply castle. Notice that black had no trouble getting castled, and the one game that I'm following uh, where white played the move queen to c2, I guess to put some pressure on the black king, um, this ended up being a mistake. It was uh, Armengo versus Navar uh, Navarro, um, Armengo Navarro versus um, Shevliv in um, Manresa in 1993, and that game continued queen h4, bishop g3, queen h6, and white was unable to castle and complete his development. And this caused a huge issue, so I'll actually just show the finish of that game real quick. As you can see, white's having some serious issues on the diagonals and in the middle of the board. And this problem simply got worse, and eventually uh, white was forced to resign and never did manage to develop his rook on the a1 square. It's really critical in the Vienna for white that white manages to finish his development in these lines, especially the lines where white plays this early uh, pawn to f4. He has to be very careful that he gets all of his pieces out. So that's basically how you meet f4. You're going to play d5, and you're kind of going to play uh, one of these two lines. So d5, and then f takes e5, knight takes e4. The other move that gets played here is the move knight to f3, and the move that I recommend here is bishop to c5. And then there's two moves that get played here or that have been played here, both of which seem to turn out pretty well for black. Although what's interesting is after the move d4, bishop b4, bishop d2, uh, there was a game between Andrikin and Kramnik, which Kramnik lost. But <laughs> what's amazing is uh, Kramnik, number one, Kramnik has lost tons of games against the Vienna. I can't explain it. Um, he always seems to get huge advantages against the Vienna too. In this particular game, uh, Kramnik played the theory correctly, and I think when it comes to opening theory, I think we can trust Kramnik. But in this uh, uh, Andrikin versus Kramnik game, uh, the game continued bishop d2, c5, and this is absolutely correct. And then after knight takes, takes, bishop takes, takes, knight g1, castles, already black is better. You know, it, this is very similar to previously discussed things. Uh, black is going to be putting some obvious pressure on the d4 square, and Black's king is safer, and Black's development is smoother. So how Kramnik managed to um, make a very serious kind of error, Kramnik already started going wrong with the move queen g5. And I've, I've noticed this in other Kramnik games. Like It seems like where Kramnik sometimes make, makes mistakes is in handling the center of the board. Kramnik really likes well-defined pawn structures with well-defined plans, and he does very well in them. That's why he does very well in things like the Catalan. And he does very well when things are very stable in the middle of the board and kind of nothing's going on. And this is something a handful of players have been able to take advantage of. Uh, notably, uh, Topolov took advantage of it in at least one game in the World Championship match, and Anand took advantage of it a couple of times. So Queen G5 is a mistake, and it's a mistake because what Black needs to do is he keep he needs to keep going after the middle of the board. Actually, Queen C7 is decisive advantage Black because Black can actually collapse this center. After Queen C7, Bishop B3, the idea is Knight takes E5. Sacrificing this knight to collapse the center, d takes e5, queen c3, king f2, queen takes e5, just would have been major advantage black. I make no qualms about that. This is just major advantage black. Um, Kramnik should have had a decisive advantage in his game um, against Hendrikin, uh, but it didn't turn out that way, and Kramnik ended up losing. But it seems like Kramnik always loses to the Vienna, probably because it, we, we often have a an undefined pawn structure in the Vienna, and Kramnik seems to have some troubles with that. Um, he does very good in defined pawn structures. So, anyways, so the alternative after bishop c5 was queen e2, and after queen e2, there was a game that went uh, bishop g bishop to f5, uh, knight d1, knight c6, d3, and this gets really interesting because this was a game between Jobava and Mamanjarov. Now, what Mamanjarov did is he just left this knight hanging. <laughs> Uh, for several moves. And the reason he got away with it is because if at any point white tries to take this knight, black ends up getting just this blistering attack against the king, sort of similar to the variation where I had the queen run around and take all the pawns.
So after, say, queen e7, knight e3, bishop e6, if we were to take this knight right now, I'll give you a sample. Like, say, d e4 takes on e4, knight d2, castles queenside, knight e4, queen h4, hitting queen, king, and knight, knight g3, we would play knight takes e5, and just huge problems down the d-file, e-file, king is still in the middle of the board, and we still haven't developed half of our army. Actually, more than half of our army, more like 60% of our army. We haven't developed four of our remaining pieces, and it's not clear that they'll ever get out. Okay, so the game continued instead with c3, castles queenside, d4, and then the issue here is that, again, white hasn't managed to finish his development, and black at some point can simply break open the middle of the board because no matter what, if you look at the center, it may look stable, but black can break up that middle with a move like f6 or c5 later at any point. But this fact that these pieces on the back rank, these bishops and this rook have not gotten out yet, and the fact that the king is in the middle, it counts for a lot. So after g3, that's exactly what black did. Black just immediately played f6, ef6, queen f6, bishop g2, and he just started um, sacrificing material to break open the middle of the board and take advantage of the fact that the king was still living there. Um, White had he couldn't even take some of this stuff right away because he was trying to, to get his pieces active enough to where he could survive. But unfortunately, that just wasn't going to happen against strong opposition. And after Queen H2, uh, Jobava decided to resign against Mamanjarov in Warsaw in 2013. So anyway, so that's all, you know, the first 16 minutes of this video. That's just covering what they do if they play pawn to f4, if they go back into this continuation. So I think I'm going to be splitting this video up into um, a couple of parts for the Vienna. I'm going to have like part one of the Vienna is going to be this, and I'm going to have a part two and part three. So for part two of the Vienna, I'm going to be covering the move bishop c4, and we're going to be focusing on some interesting stuff there, including the Frankenstein-Dracula variation. And for part three of this video, I'm going to be discussing um, specifically the move uh, pawn to g3. So tune in and watch those next two parts. Um, so this was part one of the Vienna, just simply covering um, the King's Gambit type setup with the move uh, pawn to f4 on move three. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something new about chess, and thank you very much for watching.